So I want to welcome everyone as we're getting to our seats. Uh, I, I'm welcoming the people in the room and the people who are out there in the virtual joining us. My name is Diana McGill. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I play a, a microsecond part of today's uh, celebration. It's a celebration of family, a family within the Department of English. We have faculty coming back throughout the years. We have an alum coming back. We're very proud to show off our family in, in the Department of English. And so I would like to invite one family member named Bob, who will introduce another family member named Bob. So Bob Wallace, please. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, I do want to welcome everyone we have here in the Ferris Reading Room. It's a great audience. And for those who are here online, I want to thank Diana for the welcome which she gives to so many of our programs and the support that her college, Arts and Sciences, has provided for the event and the reception. So we've got some nice covered goodies out there. Please enjoy them afterwards. So um, we in the English department have a lot of people to thank for making this Veterans Day reading by Bob Barth possible. I want to start with Rusty Martis, who's a director of the Veterans Resources Station here at NKU, who's done a lot to make this event possible. Rusty's there in the back of the room. Thank you, Rusty. <laughs> we have also received essential report, support from the History Department, the Honors College, the Friends of Steely Library, and the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement. We're especially grateful to Chris Strobel, and his students from the media broadcasting class for making this day's reading available to those who are attending virtually. We are happy to have NKU's Barnes & Noble bookstore at a table in the back of the room to sell copies of Bob's new book if you want to get it after the reading. And we're delighted that Bob was able to visit Kelly Moffat's poetry class earlier this afternoon. Finally, we're grateful to archivist uh, Lois Hamill for setting up a, a display from her special collection of manuscripts and publications by Bob Barth um, in the university archives on the first floor. And she's inviting us to join her to see that display. And Bob will be there too after the readings. So this brings us to the poet we are, are all here to hear. Bob Barth grew up in Northern Kentucky, graduated from Covington Catholic High School, before serving as a Marine in Vietnam. There he was a patrol leader um, for the 1st Reconnaissance Battalion in Quang Nam Province. After that service, he enrolled in Northern, Kentucky, Northern Community College, which quickly evolved into Northern Kentucky State College, a four-year school that was beginning right then on this campus. Uh, Bob was an English major who graduated from our first ever graduating class in 1973. By the time NKU became a university in 76, he was preparing to pursue a master's degree at Stanford University in Palo Alto. After returning from California, Bob began to publish chapbooks by other poets out of his home in Erlanger. I went to the basement and saw that stuff done. It's amazing what you did. Bob for other poets during those years. At the same time, he's also gathering material for his first major collection of Vietnam War poems, Looking for Peace, published in 1985. It was followed by A Soldier's Time in 87, Deeply Dug In in 2003, No Turning Back in 2016, and this year, Learning War selected Vietnam War poems. Bob Barth has become one of our nation's most distinguished Vietnam War poets because of the way in which he enriches his own direct experience of warfare with what he has learned from previous poets from the time of Homer and Marshall in ancient Greece and Rome up through George Gascoigne in the early Renaissance and the great English poets of the First World War and American poets of his own generation. I've had the pleasure of following Bob's poetry since I arrived here as an assistant professor straight out of graduate school in 1972. Bob's primary mentor during those early years 
was Tom Zaniello, who also arrived here as an assistant professor in 1972. It was Tom who suggested that Bob do his graduate work at Stanford University, where Tom had done his own studies. Tom Zaniello is retired from NKU and now lives in Washington, D.C., but he's with us today so that he can make some comments about Bob and his poetry immediately after the reading. After that, we'll have time for a few questions before we go down to the display in the archive. So first it's Bob Barth, then Tom Zaniello, then some questions, and then the archive. So please welcome Bob Barth. Um, thank you for the introduction, Bob. Uh, I'm gonna read from this book, and I guess I wanna say by way of the beginning that as I view the book, the poems are not anti-war poems. They're not pro-war poems. They are an attempt to understand rationally and describe a historical event, or at least the parts I saw, imagined, or in which I participated. The book's divided into three parts, and it has an introductory poem and a concluding poem. Uh, the three parts, consist of first a series, a sequence really, of epigrams. The second part of the book consists of much longer poems, and the third part of the book consists of miscellaneous epigrams. And I want to read some poems from each of the sections. But if you will indulge me, I want to start by reading a fairly recent unpublished poem to acknowledge the day. This is November 11th, which was originally Armistice Day. And I have been reading for many, many years the World War I poets. And I've always felt a kind of affinity with the poet and memoirist Edmund Blunden. This is a poem about Blunden. But I want to begin by quoting a very brief passage in November 1968, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the armistice, Blunden wrote this in the Daily Express. I have, of course, wondered when the effect of the old war would lose its imprisoning power. Since 1918, hardly a day or night passed without my losing the present and living in a ghost story. Even when the detail of dreams is fantasy, the setting of that strange world insists on torturing. This is my poem, Edmund Blunden, 1896 to 1974. Oh, there's a, there's a reference to an MC in here. That's a military cross, which at the time was Britain's second highest award for valor. Edmund Blunden, a shepherd in a great coat the MC appended unacknowledged. You patrolled old battlefields, the trenches, no man's land. The rear, the transports, nature all despoiled. The shattered houses, farms, and roadside shrines. But most of all, you celebrated troops, the comrades you remembered all your life. You would not, could not, let the horror go, nor undermine affection for your friends. I honor you for that. I understand. Um, and now we can go to Vietnam by way of the Trojan War. This is the introductory poem to the book. It's titled Reading the Iliad. Volume and desk, coffee and cigarette forgotten, the reader held in Homer's mind looks upon Greeks and Trojans fighting yet the heroes and foot soldiers, thin and blind, forced marching for the sticks. But suddenly, stunned by the clamor under smoky skies, boasting and taunting, he looks up to see not the God-harried plain where Hector tries his destiny, not the room. Instead, a mountain covered with jungle, on one slope a chateau with garden, courtyard, a rococo fountain, and faces down, hands tied, six bodies in a row.
Uh, these four epigrams are from the sequence that is the first part of the book. And the first one is titled, One Way to Carry the Dead. A huge shell thundered. He was vaporized and close friends breathing near, internalized. The next poem has a Vietnamese title, Sin Loi. Sin Loi roughly translates as sorry about that. And it was used by troops all the time. Um, if somebody wanted to bum a cigarette and you didn't have one, you said, don't have any Sin Loi. If you called artillery onto a friendly village by mistake, Sin Loi. Uh, this is titled Sin Loi. A sucking chest wounds nature's way of saying, Jack, this ain't your day. Up against the wall. These dead troops gave their country fame, which country travestied their story. Now only kin recall each name, only the dead recall their glory. The last poem of this sequence is titled Epilogue. Fifty years later, the poor sons of bitches learn jungle rot, decaying flesh, still itches and spreading body part by body part, even corrupts the chambers of the heart. Um, second part of the book is consists of much longer poems. Some of them are autobiographical, most of them are not. Um, I only mention that because many of them are written in the first person because I simply found that a more forceful way to write the poems, to create speakers. The first one is a two-part poem, and it's titled Letter from a Staging Area, Arriving in Country, February 1968. I could see nothing beyond the window pane but darkness not a light on the wingtip to trick the blackness and assume a context. And yet the crew chief stood, signaling us to fasten seatbelts and extinguish smokes. We dropped. The plane soon touched down in Da Nang, and I prepared to head for Indian country, as they say over here. A convoy waited in a kind of alley formed by Quonset huts and barbed wire fencing. Sleepy drivers stood in quiet groups, pulling on cigarettes held in cupped hands like small erratic lanterns or napped on front seats, while across the runways a line of phantoms sorted into darkness. The only other sounds were the rasped orders of officers who hustled us to trucks and our own clumsy scuffling, grabbing gear and climbing over tailgates into truck beds. The six spies started up and then moved slowly through cratered streets, Vietnam had receded, it seemed, to a mere feeling of thick dust and smell of strange foods and decay and fear through all the putrid stench. I could see little, only the darkness, and immediately behind our truck, two white slits, blackout lights. Part two. Within a short time after our arrival, the VC rocketed the staging area. There's something terrifying, even more, something unreal in the incoming rounds. I'd known of them, of course, and naturally I'd feared them in an abstract sort of way. All the test firings in the States on ranges, on ranges set up much less to teach proficiency, I think, than fear were useless. And why not? For it's one thing to marvel at the power, the pure destructive force you can inflict on enemies, something else altogether, imagining yourself those enemies. It's just not possible. But there I was, asleep one minute, stumbling to war the next. Suspended in impacted time, I waited, hearing all too sharply the thump and crash, the pings as smaller pieces of shrapnel hit tin bulkheads. What was it like? Like suddenly the true platonic forms shredded the shadows? I can't explain, not really. 
All I know is that I lay in dark green skivvies, helmet and flak jacket, rooting, nose furrowing the trenches dust, closer to nature than I'd ever been, too stark in the pus yellow light from flares, listening for exploding rocket rounds, yet hearing, too, the interrupting screams and cursing wounded crying out for Corman, and thinking, okay, 13 months to go. This uh, poem is going, in fact, to return a little bit to World War I. Um, obviously, the landscape in Vietnam was not the landscape of the Western Front, but there were occasionally similarities. Uh, this is an outpost. There is a muddy trench. There are bunkers. There is concertina wire around the perimeter. And because there is a garbage dump inside it, there are rats. Um, and because of that, I thought of the World War I poets, and they are mentioned in the poems, in the poem. Wilfred Owen, Edmund Blunden, and Siegfried Sassoon. This is titled, A Letter to the Dead. The outpost trench is deep with mud tonight. Cold with the mountain winds and two weeks rain, I watch the concertina. The starlight scope hums and rats assault the bunkers again. You watch with me, Owen, Blunden, Sassoon. Through sentry duty, everything you meant thickens to fear of nights without a moon. War's war. We are, my friends, no different. Uh, the, the next poem... It's titled Night Peace, and, and it mentions Puff in it. Sometimes Puff the Magic Dragon, sometimes Spooky. It's a AC-47 gunship that was called in at night uh, and was armed with three miniguns and basketball flares. And the miniguns fired so rapidly when it fired at night even though every fifth round was a tracer, it looked like a pure red line coming from the sky to the ground. That's referred to here. And the blue-green tracers would have been North Vietnamese Army tracers going back up. Night piece. No moon, no stars, only the leech-black sky, until Puff rends the darkness, spewing out his thin red flames, and then the quick reply of blue-green tracers climbing all about. At night, such lovely ways to kill, to die. The next three poems form a kind of trilogy. Um, so there's a little trilogy of reconnaissance poems. The first one is the insert. Our view of sky, jungle, and fields constricts into a sinkhole covered with saw grass, undulating, soon whip slant as the chopper hovers at four feet. Wrapped, boot-deep in slime, we deploy ourselves in a loose perimeter, listening for incoming rockets above the thump of rotor blades, edgy for contact, junkies of terror, impatient to shoot up. Nothing moves, nothing sounds. Then, single file, we move across a stream bed toward high ground. The terror of the inserts quickly over, too quickly and more quickly every time. Uh, the second poem of the trilogy is one I've tried to write for 40 years. Never could. Um, I don't mean I wrote every week or something, but, you know, I'd forget about it for years and come back to it, and I could never make it do what I wanted. And then last year, in fact, just in time to slide it into the book, I decided that the problem all along had been various kinds of things I was trying to do in the poem. Be ironic, be cynical, whatever. And I decided that really the solution was to write a simple, straightforward narrative poem, to try to write it in as level a tone as I could, and to try to let whatever rhythms come through the poem themselves to carry whatever 
emotion there was going to be, and it worked. There are two Vietnamese phrases in the poem. One is Didi, which means scram or beat it. The second one is Mao Len, which means fast or speedily. This is titled The Patrol. We slipped through NBA patrols around, supplies dug into mountains, and a class outside of Quonset Hut where cadres scribbled tactics on a blackboard. All this beneath the triple canopy deep in the mountains. At times, patrols passed barely three feet off while we knelt motionless and camouflaged. I wanted a surprise assault right there, but that was not our mission. Ours to watch, call in intelligence, and then Dee Dee as quietly as possible. And yet, as we withdrew, someone stepped on a twig. Time stopped. The NVA began to gabble and beat the bush, and I got on the horn to call an air support to cover us. As the two phantoms dropped 500 pounders, the shrapnel spinning near and secondary explosions rocking the landscape, we moved through the thick undergrowth until, at last, emerging from the jungle, we set up on a bare hilltop where we could observe NVA sallies from the jungle and laid out our fields of fire while radioing for an emergency extraction Mao Len. No choppers flew that evening. We dug in. And the last of the trilogy, um, when my daughter was little, she would ask about Vietnam. And she didn't care about the war. She didn't know anything about the war. All she knew was there was a jungle. And if there was a jungle, there had to be exotic animals. So yes, there are rock apes and elephants and tigers and so forth. And not for her, but for myself, I decided to write a series of poems in which the animals would not necessarily be the main characters, but I would write a poem that would have rock apes in. I would write a poem that had elephants. They, they all went into the wastebasket where they belong. But the tigers remained. Uh, the title of this poem is the motto of the Marine Corps First Reconnaissance Battalion, Swift, Silent, Deadly. Somewhere along the tangled mountain slopes, slyly edging the camps and villages, the tiger pads. He is at once our emblem and fear, and did he know, almost extinct. This, this poem is decidedly not autobiographical. It's titled, A Letter to My Infant Son. I don't have one. A Letter to My Infant Son Outside Da Nang. Someday, when you are hunting attic trunks or hear your buddies boasting of brave fathers, I know that all excited you will ask me to tell war stories. How shall I answer you? I still remember my best childhood friends, two brothers, how I envied them. Their father had given them his medals and his chevrons, and I remember fumbling with delight the green and khaki stripes, the tarnished brass. Happier, sitting still, I heard them tell their father's stories, which each night I worked through closely, casting and recasting them in varied forms. Always I was the hero. And so, my dear, how shall I answer you? Shall I be silent when you ask, preferring childish amazement, even childish anger, trusting you to return with a child's kiss and quick forgiveness? War is not the story that you would have me tell you, as I heard it. And what is courage? Too many things, it seems. Carelessness, fatalism, or an impulse. Yet it is none of these. True courage is hidden in unexpected terms and places, in performing simple duties day by day, in sometimes saying no when necessary, in most of all refusing to despair. Even suppose a man is brave one time, is truly brave, I mean. Will he be brave a second time? In other ways? Perhaps. There are few glorious stories in this war. 
small child, you will not comprehend the rot, disease, mud, rain, the mangled friend who curses the chance that saved him while you look at him, wishing him dead almost, the bitterness you realize you may not understand, the children's bodies small as yours is now. War is too much of sentimentality, which you soon learn is almost always brutal, however sad, however pitiful. So when you ask someday to hear war stories, though I would have you truly understand, how shall I answer you if not with silence? Uh, some of the poems in the book came about because I would wonder what it was like to do this, that, or the other thing, and, and I would create speakers, obviously, as I attempted to understand it. So, you know, there's a poem by a chaplain and a sniper, and in this case, I wondered what it would be like to work in a graves registration unit in country. And this is titled Office of the Dead. Death's mostly distant here of late, and random with the seediness of plain bad luck, nothing like fate. But the dead are neither more nor less, just dead. I check their metal tags for eight hours till my duty ceases, body counting the body bags. I do not have to count the pieces. The next poem was an attempt to salvage a very bad poem written and published in like 1988 or 89. Um, and I think I managed to save a little of the beginning, a little of the end, and completely gutted the middle of the poem. And I titled it Six and a Wake Up. And I gave it to some people and they made heroic efforts to understand what that title meant and really didn't. And it occurred to me, well, it's probably pretty Vietnam specific. Um, when you started getting short, which was usually about 52 days, because some people would give out a deck of cards, a, a, a card at a time to count down their final 52 days in country. You counted down and then you got to, well, in this case, it's six and a wake up, day six. Then you have five and a wake up, four and a wake up, three and a wake up, two and a wake up, one and a wake up, and the wake up meant you got up that morning, picked up your orders, and went to the airport and left Vietnam. Um, and I've always sort of been fascinated by the language of leaving Vietnam. If you were in World War I and you were a member of the British Expeditionary Force, you wanted to go back to Blighty. And that was pretty much it. That was England. There was nothing more to say about it. But if you were an American, you had the wake up when you went to the airport to get on the Freedom Bird, which would take you back to the world. Um, and I started thinking, well, you know, wake up from what? So is Vietnam a nightmare? Maybe a Dantesque journey through hell without a wise Virgil to take you? A kind of medieval uh, dream vision? Uh, there's, there's probably a little allegory somewhere buried in all of this. But to help people with the title, I gave it a new title, it is now titled Short Timer, Six and a Wake Up. Of bush time memories, this lingers. A mountain outpost with two fingers like a crab's pincers that hook down south to a valley. An ash mound and scorched earth starkly documented the rage some grunt platoon once vented. And just beyond, at the far edge, a long berm formed a kind of ledge, below which ran a dirt-packed road equipped to handle any load. Between the pinchers, tangled brush grew to eight feet, and in it lush green vines, heat and humidity were dense as the South China Sea. Uh, this is Elegy for a Dead Friend. 
Mock night of black clouds seemingly withdrew into deep space. Then our break ended, too. Was it the quickened beauty of that day that made you careless as you forced your way beyond the hut's packed earth, through the hedgerows? Was it that letter? Simply chance? Who knows? You tripped a mine. Explosion and then scream, blast and echo. I heard them in a dream of foliage. Dirt fell. Smoke caught my eye as it drifted across the china sky. First to reach you, I saw the uniform ragged, knee-length, but could not keep you warm for all my curses, from all my first aid, feeling that I, not you, had been betrayed. You lay there. I, who thought myself long-hardened, learned fear extended beyond self-regard. As if that mine was a mirror you confronted, face pressed to glass, no matter what I wanted, you would not slip past, leaving me this loss, liking too much your sudden helplessness. Oh, the next two poems have a title, Meditations After Battle. And the two Meditations After Battle each one has, as its title, a half a line from Virgil's Aeneid. So the first one is titled Sunt Lacrimae Rerum, which is pretty literally, there are tears in things. And all around the dead. So many ways to die, it hurt the heart to look and feel sun burning overhead. We stack the bodies on scorched grass apart. The second one is titled Et Mentem Mortalia Tangent, uh, and mortality touches the mind. Death was the context and the only fact. Amidst the stench, I almost could believe there was a world of light where if souls lacked broken bodies a while, they would retrieve them, mended, where no one need longer grieve. The next poem um, is titled Fieldcraft. At last, the senses sharpen. All around, I listen closely. Under the dull sound of distant artillery and the shrieking planes diving with napalm, under the dry crack of automatic rifles, at the back of consciousness, almost, one sound remains. Mud sucking at bare feet as they are going between the rice chutes, nearly silent, knowing. This is titled Last Letter. We are haunting these same mountains yet again, tracking down phantoms, and my weariness soaks in like fear. It deadens even pain. This afternoon, we found 12 carcasses around bomb craters. Though I choked on the smell of maggot breeding flesh at first, I bless those bodies now, for they are flaunting hell. Bless them, for they are shattered and awry. Bless them, for I have heard the truth they tell. Come, friend, it is not difficult to die. This is the last poem in the second section of the book, and it's titled A Letter from the World, March 1969. You'll never come in from your last patrol. Down to six spades, your short time calendar. You count long rations left, each fighting hole, certain you know exactly where you are when your reflections snap from dwindling days to clean clothes, women, loafing, and cold beer. 
And yet that reverie indulged betrays the horrors you contain. And once back here, as you'll discover, you must sleep at night, walking one more patrol. Relearn in bed, patties, jungle, fear, till with the first light, you're oily with the rancor of the dead. Uh, the final section of the book consists of more or less miscellaneous epigrams. And the first one I want to read is titled SOP. And it's this epigram that gave the book its title. SOP. I learned what soldiers learn. Neither a flag nor brassy phrases count much under fire. Men fight from pride, grief, fear of censure, Mostly, though, it's closest buddies who evoke some kind of courage, if only hanging on. Um, these poems tend to be, too, perhaps a bit more satirical than the ones in the first section were. Um, this is titled Social Darwinism. Professionally aided, the privileged became, until the danger faded, the weak and halt and lame. Uh, and this goes right along with it. This is for part of a generation. Worn out, the toaster, television, car, are thrown out, junked, or traded for the new, just as America abandoned you. Conspicuous consumption, Asian war. Uh, this one sort of annoys some people. Uh, I guess others do too. But this is titled Grunt Fantasy uh, and, and specifically has to do with grunts in Vietnam. Another war and swabbing tears with sleeves over the coffin a rich mother grieves. This doesn't have anything to do with Vietnam at all. Um, it's the only poem in the book that doesn't. And it's titled Epitaph for the Fallen at Cameroon. That was a French Foreign Legion defeat, uh, heroic defeat, which is what they celebrate, that took place in Mexico, in which a small band of French legionnaires were attacked by an overwhelming force of Mexican soldiers. And after holding out for a period of time, and I think down to like maybe the last three people who, was, who made a frontal assault on the Mexican army, um, they were pretty much slaughtered. The lieutenant who commanded them had an artificial wooden hand. And it is that wooden hand which is the sacred relic of the French Foreign Legion. Every year it is brought out and the French Legion dress in their most ceremonial uniforms you know, carrying their axes and with their aprons and so on. And this, this is a translation of, of a poem which is apparently in French, in Les Envolides, but which I found as a Latin translation. And according to the note of the translation I found, said that it was set up somewhere in Mexico. Never heard that story anywhere else except this one reference. But anyway, this, but the poems are in fact the same. I just know Latin and not French. <laughs> Epitaph for the Fallen at Cameroon. Fewer than 60 soldiers lie here, but they fought an army till submerged in its immensity. Though life deserted these French troops did not, though life deserted these French troops, honor did not 
that 30th day of April, 1863. Um, and they're called French troops because if a legionnaire died for France, he automatically became a French citizen. Okay, next poem is a squib. I, was, I, I just dashed this off and was going to throw it away. Um, and it's, I, I still don't think it's much more than a squib, but I looked at it and thought, this kind of says something, a little bit at least, about being a grunt in Vietnam. And it's titled, As Good As It Gets. A break from humping, bug juice zapping leeches, three sips of water, and pound cake and peaches. Uh, pound cake and peaches, by the way, were sea rats. Um, there was a, a little can of pound cake. There was a can of fresh peaches. And I could never get into them myself, but most of the people I knew thought this was like the highest delicacy in Vietnam. They'd trade you anything to get hold of your peaches and your, and your pound cake. And I thought that was great because I much preferred the apricots and the pears. The, these peaches were in such a thick syrup, it was unbelievable. But anyway, that would have been high times in Vietnam. Uh, ambush. This poem is about the difference between intellectually knowing something and realizing its truth. Ambush. For 13 months, death was familiar. We knew its methods and the odds, thus war. And yet, I never once saw dying eyes that were not stunned or shattered by surprise. Uh, the last poem from the epigrams that I want to read is titled Snapshot RVN. RVN is Republic of Vietnam, um, South Vietnam, if you will. And this is not the same, this is not about the same photo that's on the poster. Um, but, it, but it would be very, very similar. And when a friend of mine sent me that picture that's on the poster, um, I guess it was right before Christmas, and I showed it to my wife, and she looked at it and said, you're just kids. And I said, yeah, I guess so. The kids with a lot of firepower. This is Snapshot RVN. I see us there as we were then, sinewy, strong, and very young, lounging in pre-formation when the camera snapped. And I am stung seeing such blasted innocence that we have carried ever since. The last poem in the book, the coda, is titled Republic of Vietnam Campaign Medal with Device. If you've seen any of these, you've probably seen it. It's the one with the green and white stripes, and it's a kind of starburst. And on the ribbon part of it, there is a, like a silver-looking, it's not real silver, but a silver-looking scroll that has 1960 dash on it. Um, there were two of these. The South Vietnamese government gave one out to the Arvin, that is its own army, the Army of the South. Vietnam, and to the French, and that was given out. And then in 1960, they issued a new one. Um, that's this one, which they gave to their troops, and because it is a South Vietnamese award. And then in either 1965 or 1966, it was authorized to be worn by American personnel. Um, And it still says 1960 dash, which will be explained in this poem. Republic of Vietnam campaign medal with device. See 1960 dash, but nothing follows. And in that missing date, a country's lost, overrun, routed, and dissolved, unable even to document its ending. But all the troops who rate that medal, ah, for them their several dates are to be read or will be read in cemeteries as each man comes in from his last patrol. Thank you.
Let's start with 1973, only 48 years ago. Um, in 1973, I was just three years away from an active life as an anti-Vietnam. Sorry. Maybe I got another one in here. Okay, well, we're going to have to go without one. Sorry about that. In 1973, I was just three years away from an active life as an anti-Vietnam War protester. And Bob Barth was just four years away from active military service in Vietnam. There are only two other people whom I've known longer, Fran Zaniello, she's the record holder, but Bob Wallace, of course, with whom I began teaching here in Northern Kentucky in 1972. Um, there are two other uh, people in competition here, Joan Ferrante and Ron Ellis close thirds. So this is perhaps an amazing reunion, celebrating that day when Bob walked into my literary criticism class in 1973. We shared a love of poetry, and especially a style of poetry Bob became an expert and practitioner in, called the plain style. We bonded on a mutual admiration for the poetry and criticism of Ivor Winters, Stanford professor, and his wife, Janet Lewis, a novelist. Bob went on to publish an extraordinary body of poetry, as well as becoming the leading editor of both Winters and Lewis's work. I took one class with Ivor Winters at Stanford and was hooked on his poetry and many of the poets that I had never heard of that he introduced in class. But Winters was also my hero because he took a year off teaching in the 1930s to write a defense appeal of a Stanford University employee who had been wrongly convicted, sent for execution in San Quentin for killing his wife, who actually had died as a result of the fall in her bathroom. I dedicated my book on this case to Ivor Winters and Janet Lewis, who saved David Lamson's life. I met Ivor Winters outside of class only once. He was the grader for the required graduate exam in French I took at Stanford. I went to his office after the exam, and he handed me my blue book with the words, low pass, <laughs> written across the front cover. I asked him if low pass was still a pass. He nodded, yes. A low pass in French was a very low price to pay for my lifelong friendship with Bob Barth. Bob's poetry is a unique blend of classical, classical tradition and his experiences in Vietnam. The titles of so many his book, of his books alone reveal that incredible combination. Looking for Peace, Forced Marching to the Sticks, Vietnam War Poems, Simonides in Vietnam, which has my favorite poem, only two lines, based on a sixth century Greek poet celebrating the heroic dead at the Battle of Thermopylae. The poem reads, Go tell the Spartans that we hold this land, deeply dug in, obeying their command. Other titles were Semper Fidelis. Bob's dad, who was a Marine, is on the cover of that collection. Deeply dug in, learning war. After all these years, Northern Kentucky's archives, leadership below I say Hema, has decided to have an archive of Bob's work. And I have gathered my 48 years of letters, drafts of poetry, oh. God knows what else, in a volume so in the archives. It's a small gesture of thank you for his work.
I'll entertain any questions anybody has. Yes. Well, because I was interested in writing about, in my case, the war in Vietnam, and, you know, um, be a lie to say I hated every minute of it. Be a, probably a lie to say I wanted to do it again, but um, no, I mean, I wanted to write about it honestly, and, and the fact of the matter is, honestly, there are good parts of it, there are bad parts of it. It was perhaps undertaken with honorable intentions. Certainly, I enlisted with honorable intentions. Uh, it quickly veered away from them. But, you know, that certainly does not take away from anybody who served there and thought they served, again, an honorable enlistment for honorable reasons. Um, so I, I basically, it's, it's, it does, it's not one or the other because I wanted to be honest. And if I'm honest, you know, you're probably going to read some of those poems and, and say, well, that's kind of anti-war. And maybe read a couple of others and say, well, that's, that's not. I mean, I just, I tried to be honest about it. Um, you know, and then, then you, you get into the whole issue of what the war became, and then that's another whole issue altogether. You know, it sort of just devolved into this basically war of attrition. I mean, all that mattered was the body count. Um, that's not what I signed up for. That's not what people I knew signed up for, but it didn't matter. You know, signed up, took an oath, did my job. Yes? Oh, okay, so what, what advice do I have for a young writer, basically? All writers, or at least most writers throughout history, from the Greeks on, learn to write by finding a model and imitating. For me, it was a question of finding, find, basically finding the, the model to imitate that I wanted. I mean, I knew sort of vague, okay, I'd like to do this, but I don't see anybody doing this. And then, now we go to Ivor Winters, who shows me these 16th century plain style poets, and I read them and say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to do. But you know, you have to find your models. I mean, when I was an undergraduate, I certainly took 16th century, 17th, 18th century poetry. I liked it a lot. You know, I was a, I was a big admirer of Alexander Pope. I knew I couldn't write like Alexander Pope, and by that I don't mean as well, I mean that kind of poem. Um, I loved Marshall, but I was so stupid I didn't think he could write epigrams when I was an undergraduate. I didn't think he could write epigrams in the 20th century. Um, well, yes you can. So I, I guess, you know, find a model and read. You have to read everything you can get your hands on. You know, you fill your head with all those rhythms, all those writers, and then you find the ones that seem to you to be doing something more or less like you would like to do. And then you imitate them. I mean, that's the only real advice I have. I mean, that, that's how I learned. Um, and of course, way back in the day when I was here, uh, there were no creative writing classes. You know, you, if you wrote, you might find a professor you could give a poem to and say, you know, what do you think of this? But I mean, there were, there were no creative writing courses. And I can remember 
But this, that's not, this is not going to be just a comment on Northern. This, I've seen this in lots of places. I remember a group of guys who used to sit around, drink coffee, and talk up writing. But, you know, writing is going off by yourself alone and sitting down with a pen and pencil or a typewriter, however you do it, and doing the work. They only wanted to talk about writing. They only wanted to be seen as writers. But they never wrote anything. I mean, God forbid, that's boring stuff. You have to go off by yourself. Um, you know, so is it, is it good to be in a group? It's good to be in a group if you're in a group with writers who are as serious as you are. You don't want to get in with a group of artsy, craftsy, pseudo poets. Yes? No, I did not. Um, didn't even keep a notebook. Uh, didn't even read. There were no books floating around 1st Recon Battalion. Um, I read three books in Vietnam because they floated through the recon. Um, Alfie? Oh, you think Alfie? Wait, wait for one. <laughs> Valley of the Dolls, <laughs> and Leon Uris's, um war novel, what's it called, uh, Battle Cry? Yeah, Battle Cry. That was it. Those were the only three books I saw the whole time I was in, in Recon. And I may have been about the only person who even read them. Most people didn't even bother to read. So no, I didn't. I didn't keep a notebook. I did not write letters home. I, I, wrote an, I wrote only enough letters home that I would not get in trouble for not writing home. Um, and when, and when I, I did, I guess when my dad died, um, they said, well, here are all these letters you wrote him. Well, first of all, they weren't all these letters. There weren't many. And they said, here they are. And I said, you know, I don't want them. But I don't want anybody else to have them. So I took them and trashed them. I mean, I didn't didn't really care. Um, but, you know, it's not likely that I was going to forget about over there. I mean, there's a poem that I did, did not read, but it's about uh, old salts sitting on the runway waiting to leave the country and making fun of the new arrivals in country and the, uh, the old salts are guarding their gear carbines, gold teeth, belt buckles, rags of uniforms, and so on. And the last line of the poem is, as if they'll need a souvenir to remind themselves that they fought here. I mean, I, I just I never, never doubted I would come home and, and remember this stuff vividly. So, you know, and I wasn't interested in particularly in being a writer. I mean, I came back from Vietnam in 1969 in March, and said, well, I've got a GI Bill. Guess I might as well go to college. So I came here when it was UK's Northern Community College. And, you know, I had great teachers who inspired me to turn to literature. And then it was, you know, taking off. Um, but before that, no. And I, I was a very, and I'm giving myself a lot of credit here, I was a very undistinguished high school student. <laughs> I did not want to be there, and I didn't care who knew it. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes. Oh, my. Uh, I don't know. Um, well, I don't know if you would call this learning something about myself, but I mean, when I started writing, I, for instance, you writing as a meditation, 
uh, you know, Loyola, Ignatius Loyola's meditational theories mattered to me. I mean, I guess I could say I became a more thoughtful person, absolutely. You know, I, w I wasn't so quick to say sin loy. Um, I might look at a situation instead of saying it. So, I mean, I guess I would say if you want one, uh, one brief answer, it's that. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, standard operating procedure or standing operating procedure depends on who you're talking to. And it would just be the way things were set up, say, in a unit. Here's, here's how we do things. Okay, first would have been two professors when this was still a two-year school. I mean, the, the, the new professors hadn't been started for the junior year and, and the first 300 courses added. So the first two years, it was in particular two teachers. It was Mrs. Rouse. Um, I was going to say Marge Rouse, but I would never have called her that in my life. <laughs> so Mrs. Rouse and, and Dr. Byron. Um, and then, you know, that, that got me really, really interested in literature. That, that's when I decided to become an English major because of the way those two. And then what turned the whole writing thing around was Tom Zaniello. So those three people pretty much impacted everything I did here and influenced everything I did here. Oh, and I'm surprised that when, when we were downstairs when I first got here, we went over to the wall to look at the uh, pictures on the wall of the distinguished professors. And I mean, I saw Dr. Byron first. Um, Mrs. Rouse should have been there. And I and that, that's not just me. You can you can ask almost anybody who had her. If you know if she could if she couldn't make you interested in literature, forget it. You were a rock. You know you you had no prayer. So that was it. Three three professors, and I you know and I would. I guess I would hope any student could find three professors. I mean more better. And, and I didn't, you know, I'm not saying the rest were bad. These three just really inspired me to go ahead. I'll just add to a couple things Bob just said. Uh, one is um, Marjorie Rouse, we called her Marjorie, and, and uh, Byron, were Bill Byron. Uh, they were incredible teachers who we young ones who came in 72 with the whole influx around the country. Uh, we got to know Marge, but uh, Byron had died already, but we remember him with the Byron Memorial Award we give every year to the outstanding graduate in the English department. And that was Bob, I think you're, you're um, the first person to get that award and it's been so meaningful to all of our students since then. And that ties in with the fact that uh, Tom and I who came in 72, we're referred to often as the uh, generation of the founders of this university. But we had the people who preceded us were here. They were the real founders, Bill Byron and Marge Rouse and all of their colleagues. And that was one thing that bothered me when uh, the whole founders hall business came and, and honoring our group that that whole group of teachers was overlooked. I mean, this wouldn't have been the place it is without all of those teachers. And uh, I'm thinking about Marge Rouse in particular. Here she was with a master's degree, could not get a job here now because she doesn't have a PhD. Um, and here come these hotshot professors from Ivy League and West Coast and all that. And she welcomed us 
white family. Um, it was incredible uh, what she did for our young faculty as well as Bob. So uh, we are at the time where we get to think about moving down to the archive. Lois is here, our archivist, and she has a display of Bob's work down there, which includes the Byron Award Cup that he received that year. If you have individual questions for Bob, he'll be happy to answer them. And if you want to buy this incredible book, uh, Brett is there from the bookstore and would be happy to uh, sell you a copy. So I want to thank you all for coming and thank Bob for that incredible reading and Tom for coming all the way to Washington, D.C., to from Washington, D.C., to, to share your experience with this amazing um, former student and colleague and somebody we admire so much. And I'll tell you, uh, listening to those poems again today was amazing. So thank you.